Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome executive coach and best-selling author, Mr. Mark Thompson. Hey guys, good morning, good morning. I have such a treat for you right now. I'm, I'm delighted to have the honor to lead a conversation with Aisha Evans and Wim Elfrink. Could you come on out here, folks? I would love to give a big greeting to these two incredible innovators. There you go. Thank you. And we were just quickly pledging in the back. Have you pledged yet? Should just take a moment and congratulate the initiative to bring education to the world and do that through Utah. Can we give them a big round of applause again for that amazing initiative? Does that just rock? It's amazing. I am Mark Thompson, I'm a CEO coach and I am from the other Silicon Valley in Silicon Valley and Silicon Alley in New York. And look at what you've achieved here at Silicon Slopes. Could we just take a moment also to call out Clint and the team at Silicon Slopes, NASDAQ's vision, Newskin, and others. Can we give them a big round of applause for what they've achieved here? 23,000 people coming together for this event. And one of the great honors that I have in the work that I do is I get an opportunity to be inspired by people I learned so much from. And these two folks have been transforming every organization and industry that, that they've had the pleasure to touch. And they've done that for decade after decade. And, and Aisha, just now, congratulations. You've just become the, the CEO of Zooks, the premier new visionary in transportation. Do you know the company? Zooks, congratulations. Thank you. Give her a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> A technologist who have been transforming many different industries, now you're going to do that in transportation. Wim, you've done that all over the world in the work that you've done at Cisco and now reinvention of company after company from those in healthcare to other industries. Maybe I could start with Aisha talking sure. a little bit about sure. this transformation in transportation. What is the vision that you have for what you're going to be accomplishing with these cars that deliver us? our families, our, our livelihoods put in your hands? They are not cars. We start right there. Okay. Um, look, transportation, connecting people and places is uh, essential, um, in, especially in dense urban environments like big cities. Uh, you don't have uh, space for more roads or anything like that. Second of all, um, in any other aspect of life, if we had 40,000 people a year dying because of, car, of accidents, somebody would do something about it. So I think we can do also better on safety. So the way we're looking at it is moving people effectively in cities, uh, whether it's because of their work life or their home life, we can make that much better. And uh, we're building a vehicle uh, from the ground up. You can call it a robot if you'd like. It's a big one, though. And uh, there is no point, in our view, taking a car that was built for a driver with a steering wheel, brakes, a console, and then removing the driver so the, driver, the car drives itself. So we're building a vehicle from the ground up that is conceived from basically for autonomy with AI. Uh, there's no steering wheel, there are no brakes, and you basically call it, it shows up, push a button, you go in, we detect that you're buckled, and off you go. You've had a very special way of bringing people together to new technologies and the way that they are able to creatively contribute to that. How, what's, what's your mission there in how you're going to bring people together to this cause? Well, I, I want to focus on things that are worthy. And I think that solving transportation, uh, first in big cities, but we will do it everywhere. Uh, certain countries maybe will even leapfrog. When people move, they get access to data, information, livelihood. Uh, you create communities. So you really impact society. And that's what we want to do. Uh, I think also these are EVs, meaning electric vehicles, uh, from an environment standpoint. Hopefully in Salt Lake, Utah, I don't have to apologize for saying the environment is super important. And uh, the more people we educate, the more people live in society, the more people are productive, the more infrastructure we'll need. So why not leapfrog and make that happen? Yeah. When you're doing this, you have to bring people together all over the world. Both you and Wim have had the pleasure of bringing people together on many continents, creatively working together towards technology outcomes that are only achievable if everybody decides to, to be all in. Wim, how have you been able to pull people together to decide to 
maybe even reinvent the way they go about something, maybe to burn their bridges and, and then build so a new way of crossing silos. Yeah. So first, a question to the audience, Mark. Yeah, I'm always interested, uh, I'm 40 years in technology, 60 plus, but 40, 60 is the new 40, as you know. Um, <laughs> who can say here in the audience that he or she was live at Woodstock? Can I see hands? Who was oh, in was Woodstock? A I hear some folks. A few. But think about it, that, that was my first challenge to technology. And uh, you know, I'm Dutch, I'm from the Netherlands, and I started a small factory building amplifiers for rock bands. If you now see how rock bands perform, hey, it's all about technology. I love technology. Technology is not a solution, hey, but it's an enabler for great solutions in the world. And so, Mark, around your question, uh, I've always worked at uh, transformational companies. Some's made it, some didn't make it. Olivetti, Xerox, Hewitt Packet, HP. Oh. HP uh, and then Cisco for 20 years. When I met John, John Chambers, the CEO, I said, John, what are we going to do? That, that, uh, uh, what, what is this all about? And he said, Wim, we're going to change the way we work, live, play, and learn. And that's what you're going to do in transport, Asia. Uh, but we were a global company. We set up innovation centers around the world. Uh, we tried to collaborate. Um, I lived five years uh, in India, in Bangalore had to see what technology can do for underprivileged people. And the first thing they taught me there, if you talk about prices, Wim, wherever you talk about a dollar, read a rupee. If you achieve that, you will be relevant in India. Uh, but so what I learned in my career, what, what, what worked for me, Mark, uh, is uh, from a leadership point of view, there are so many books, but uh, I always say what worked for me are three things, authenticity, um, you know, be genuine, people feel that, build great teams and reinvent yourself every five years. Mm. You expect it from others, do it yourself. And so, like I said, I retired uh, four years ago of Cisco and I started to look at new opportunities and technology that fit my three characteristics. Well, you have one of those that is about healthcare and enabling and empowering people to be able to take control of their health. That is all about your heart and giving people peace of mind there. How are you going about that? You said a lot of right things, peace of mind. So I did one of my devastating learnings was suddenly at 62, I ran marathons in my life. I eat relatively healthy. I have a great family, not too much stress. And suddenly I was there, two full occlusions, um, small head attack, and then you start thinking about why didn't I knew this? Why didn't I see it coming? Uh, that, uh, in transport, a Tesla that uh, produces a gigabyte of data per second. It, my heart gives 70 beats a minute, and I know nothing. Suddenly, you realize that you have two full occlusions. So uh, that, that brings us the big idea, you know, how can we see our heart as an antenna? And uh, uh, this is basically a device. Um, to capture the signals of your heart. Uh, you can pull it open. I don't know whether the, the camera can see it. <laughs> uh, you put two fingers. I'm not going to demo it because then I have to take my shirt off. I will not do that here. Uh, but you press it to your heart. Uh, your phone receives the signal via Bluetooth. It helps you adapt it. Uh, if you're panicking and you push it to the wrong side, push it on the right side. It goes to the clouds. Uh, we have 3D scanning. Um, algorithms, and a readout goes to your cardiologist, to your MD, mm. uh, to you, and says, uh, phone 911, you know, uh, there is data immediately, but the best is, if you have heart disease in the family, and you can start when you're 20, and you create a baseline, and you do it on a weekly basis, or whenever you exercise, so it is so simple. And I dare to show it here because it works. But now we have to go through regulation, FDA approval, clinical sure. trials. Right. And so it will be another two, three years when I'm back here. <laughs> um, I think in the US alone, we have 10 million um, what we call high-risk people who had an, a heart attack, who have a stand, 100 million people with uh, heart disease in the family. And so the price is going to be cheaper than an, uh, I would say video system at home, $200 a year. Yeah. So here we have the next unicorn. Well, it'll be a way to really transform lives and, and bring that greater peace of mind. When, sure, when, peace when, of mind. 
it makes a huge difference. Aisha, when you mm -hmm. were thinking about the strategy at Intel and, and transitioning the application of chips for all of these different uses and so forth, <coughs> how did you think about reinvention? How did this idea of only the paranoid survive that Andy Grove started here, yeah. what, what's your philosophy on how you really drive innovation and change? I think that uh, look around you and look at the big problems and the big opportunities in terms of a societal standpoint. That's one. And then from that, start applying. Uh, at Intel, uh, the, the transformation was more that uh, we did so well with the PC that, uh, and you know, when you're doing very well, I guess that's lesson number one. That's the most dangerous thing. That's time. the most dangerous thing. As soon as you start feeling life is good, it's time to ask some questions. I mean, from, a, from an innovation standpoint, because that means you're starting to saturate yeah. and you have to create the next band. The other thing is, um, I tell my children, this is a, if you're in technology right now, it's a, at least I feel, it's a golden age. Uh, we have these uh, exploitation periods where there is an invention and then, for example, uh, smartphones, right, at the beginning in 2000, whatever, seven. And then it sort of saturates, then something else happens. And we're at a time, because uh, compute right now is so efficient, uh, it keeps on uh, uh, becoming more high performance, larger power envelopes, and then you have AI. Yes, sorry, I have to say AI. I know you're tired of hearing about it, <laughs> but I'll talk about it differently. The, the AI algorithms are not new. Uh, what's new is that the computers can execute them fast enough for you to get information to either have insight or do something. Every single industry, from education, healthcare, financial, transportation, is going to be benefit from this. And I really wish that I could wake up 100 years from now, because I always say, if we woke up the people who died 1,000 years ago, and we could wake them up now and say, look at what's going on, they'd be like, oh my gosh. I think that 100 years, ago, 100 years from now, we're going to go through a massive change in how we live, love, learn, and connect. And it's because of the technology that we're all grappling with right this minute. How do you do that in a personal way? When you feel those challenges and, and challenging yourself to really go through a reinvention, to decide that you need to be thinking about new skills and new ways of, of looking at your life. You're a long way from Senegal to Paris to Georgetown to Silicon Valley to leading all over the world. How have you reinvented yourself personally? Um, I, I chase meaning. And if you chase meaning, uh, you have to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think about the play Hamilton. Um, you know, I was born in Senegal, West Africa, right? And so if I followed the linear normal path, I would have a very different life. And so I follow meaning and I, I try and keep myself open-minded to opportunities. And then I've learned to deal with failure. Those are the three things that help me innovate. I've accepted that by definition, if you're going to do transformative things, if you're going to do things that haven't done before, been done before, but they are worthy, you will fail. As a matter of fact, I always tell my team, if you're bringing me green dashboards, green means everything's on track, everything is great, and you're green every week, at some point I'm going to say... You're not trying hard enough. Darling, no. <laughs> well, that's a negative yeah. emotion. I'm just going to say, what's the better plan? There has to be one, because we're hitting the normal plan. So, to seek meaning and be open and then accept that if you're doing transformative things, occasionally you will fail, and that's a good thing. Can we give these two thought leaders, innovators, are you inspired? This is why they're leading this new century. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. You. All right, Rim. ladies and gentlemen, let's give and them Aisha. a big round of applause. Thank you Thanks all so of much. our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for traveling.